good to have you with us this morning. Um, we are in the Gospel of Matthew. It's good to be back after having a week off in, um, with COVID, but <laughs> doing good. Uh, I have this craving for hay and oats, though. And <laughs> All right, let's open in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you again for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love for us. We thank you for being with us always, even to the end of the age. And Lord, as we are looking around us, we think we're pretty close to the end of the age. And we thank you that you um, have equipped us. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us your word. And we want to grow in our faith, our trust in you. And we know that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God and so may you speak to all of us and give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, yeah, Bill says, well, you know, coming off of COVID, I could get you a stool up here and you can sit down because you're going to be up there for a couple hours. And it's like, if Joe Biden can stand for two hours, so can I. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Lord. We pray for that man. Uh, look at Matthew 15, 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, we're entering the last year of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, the religious leaders are becoming more and more critical of Jesus and his ministry. They're trying to turn the Jewish people against Jesus, but they're not being very successful. Um, the only thing they can really come up with right now is, Jesus, why don't you tell your disciples to wash their hands before they eat? You know, I mean, that's all they have. But the, uh, between the religious leaders, criticism and hatred, and the fact that many people were wanting to take Jesus by force and make him king, uh, Jesus does the unexpected. Uh, he goes into uh, Gentile territory. He goes to what we call Lebanon today. It's on the Mediterranean Sea to, um, it says here, Tyre and Sidon. That's in present-day Lebanon or Phoenicia back in that day. And so Jesus is in Gentile territory. He just takes the 12 disciples, and they go about 40 miles or so, travel from where they've been at the north part of the uh, Sea of Galilee up to the Mediterranean, uh, kind of northwest. And Jesus had just taught them. Where we left off last time, we saw the last couple things Jesus said there was that he was declaring all foods clean. And again, he's preparing the hearts of his disciples to have uh, an understanding that God loves everybody, not just the Jews, that's where their mind is, but he loves everybody. He's going to die for the sins of the world. And we saw it's not what goes into your mouth, Jesus said, that defiles you, but it's what goes into your heart. What goes into your mouth goes into your stomach and is eliminated. What goes into your heart will come out of your mouth, and that is what defiles you. Uh, he'll still have to speak to Peter about this later on. It took a long time. After the ascension of Jesus, it would be about 10 years before the, the Jewish disciples and apostles started reaching out to the Gentiles. They were slow, like some of us. And so it's in Acts chapter 10 where we read about, um, you know, Peter was at Simon the Tanner's home there, and uh, he's in Joppa. And Cornelius, the Gentile centurion, has this vision. Peter gets a vision, and the Lord's bringing them together so Peter can give the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time. And so Peter has this vision of this big white sheet being lowered down from the heavens, full of all these non-kosher animals. And this is what it says in Acts 10, starting in verse 13. A voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. Nah, you can't say that. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. Uh, we're told that the Lord did that three times with Peter. And the point of all that was to prepare Peter's heart to go to the household of Cornelius. And he would preach the gospel and he would share the good news of Jesus with Cornelius 
And, we're, you know, his house is full of all of his friends and family members just eager to hear what the Apostle Peter had to say about Jesus. And Jesus, you know, Peter would tell them all that Jesus did, who he was. And he's giving them the gospel. He came, he died for your sins, he rose from the dead. And then it says in Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, Peter never really knew when to shut up, but while he's still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed, those that were with Peter, the Jewish believers, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. And so Jesus is slowly but deliberately breaking down these barriers between the Jews and the dreaded Gentiles. So by going to Tyre and Sidon up there in Lebanon, Jesus is going to an area where the king of Tyre was actually very good friends with King David, the king of Tyre. His name was Hiram. They became very good friends. And David hired him out, and he oversaw this whole project of taking all these trees, shipping them down, bringing them up to Jerusalem. And then when David died, Solomon would use all that lumber to build the temple in Jerusalem. And so this is what we read in 1 Kings 5, verse 1. It says, Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always loved David. And so they had this very close relationship, and Hiram probably knew all about the covenant that God made with David, where God told David, a, a king will sit on your throne forever. Well, Solomon was the next in line, and it would go down the line, then the kings would all die out, but the fulfillment is Jesus Christ. And so this is preparing us for what's going to happen here in a moment. And Jesus is the only one that could fulfill that covenant where he would sit upon the throne of David forever. That gives us a little background into why Jesus goes to this area and the response he gets from this one particular Gentile woman who's in great need. Look at verse 22. So they're in this Gentile region. And behold, a woman of Canaan, so she's a Canaanite, came from that region and cried out to him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And so she instantly recognizes that Jesus is the Lord. He is the king of of kings. He's the son of David, the Messiah. Now, as we go through this section of scripture, don't think that Jesus is surprised by anything that's going on. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly what he's going to do. By the way, Jesus broke a lot of Jewish traditions and customs, and he did it on purpose. But this is one of the reasons why the Jewish religious leaders were so angry with him you know, you could not touch a leper. So they accused you, you can't touch a leper. Well, you touch a leper and they're no longer a leper. So how are you going to accuse somebody? Are you, That's a leper. You can't. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> His skin is like a baby's skin. He's fully well. You can't touch dead people. That defiles you. Well, show me a dead person that I touch that's dead. Because every time Jesus touched a dead person, like remember a little girl, Talitha Kumai, a little girl arise, and she was instantly healed. He took her by the hand. So when the Jews refused to go through Samaria because they looked at the Samaritans as unclean half-breeds, they were half-Jewish, half-Gentile, they were part of the ten northern tribes, and they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. They interbred with many of those ten tribes, and so they became known as the Samaritans. So Jesus says in John 4, we must go through Samaria. Why? Because he had to meet that Samaritan woman at the well. He had to lead her to faith in him. And she would go tell the whole village of Sychar about Jesus, and they all get saved. And so Jesus would actually stay with the Samaritans for two days. John chapter 4, verse 42, it says, Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. 
And so Jesus is breaking down barrier after barrier. He's breaking down cultural barriers. He's breaking down racial barriers. He's breaking down religious barriers. He was and is the only one who can unite all people under, if you have a banner, you can say believers in Christ or you know, followers of Jesus. That's the banner he unites people under. doesn't matter what your background, what your ethnicity. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. If you are in Christ, we're all one in Christ. I got many brothers and sisters in Northeast India. I got many brothers and sisters in Africa. I got many brothers and sisters in South America. It doesn't matter. We're all one in Jesus. He breaks down those barriers. Paul says it like this in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. But here Jesus is going to use this encounter with this Gentile woman to show his disciples that their ministry is much broader than just reaching out to their fellow Jewish brethren. In fact, the very last thing that Jesus says to his disciples by the way, there's some books out there written. Uh, I, don't, I don't like the book, but there's a book out there. Oh, the very last thing Jesus said is this, and it's not the very last thing. And they quote Jesus as saying, this is what Jesus said. No, this is the very last thing Jesus said before he ascends up into heaven. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Again, the gospel would go to the Jews first, then the Samaritans, then to all of us Gentiles as well. So here in verse 22, we have this Gentile woman crying out to Jesus, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. And why is she in such a desperate state? Because at the end of that verse, she says, My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now, you know, we can all be demon oppressed. You can be discouraged, depressed, but as a believer, you cannot be possessed. But this girl's in a bad way. She is severely demon possessed. Maybe some of you were demon possessed before you got saved and then Jesus delivered you and set you free and, you know, you're, now you're saved, you're a new creation. You cannot be possessed once you're in Christ. This is not a condominium. Oh, Satan's over here and Jesus is over there. No, Jesus owns you, all of you, so we're safe and secure in him. So this young woman... She is severely demon. I can't imagine how awful that must be to be severely, not just demon possessed, but severely demon possessed. She starts crying out to Jesus, this mother. And as we'll see, as the Greek tense implies, she keeps crying out to the Lord. She doesn't stop. She's determined. And what a contrast this woman is to the religious scribes and Pharisees. Again, they're mad because Jesus didn't wash their hands before they ate. And she's crying out to him, you're the Lord, you're the son of David, you're the Messiah, I know who you are. And isn't it interesting that she cries out, have mercy on me. That tells us how much anguish she was really in when she says, have mercy on me. Some of you can relate to this. You've had a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, and they were just out there. They're just gone in your mind. And it's like, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I just, you're so broken up over your child or parent or someone, sibling. And so she is in anguish because have mercy on me. I can't stand watching my daughter go through this. She's at the end of her rope. I mean, what's this daughter like to be severely demon possessed? She comes home and she's shrieking and screaming and who knows, clawing herself. We, we're not told, but it must have been brutal. So verse 23, she's crying out to the Lord, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. Um, again, an interesting verse. Jesus doesn't say anything to her. But his silence did not silence her. She will not let up. Sometimes we think when the Lord is silent, oh, he must not care. You know, he's not listening to me. I've been praying about this situation, about my son, my daughter for months or for years, and he doesn't care. He's just not listening. Before we answer that, God is not silent. He does hear us. 
But before we answer that, did you notice the response of the disciples? This is becoming their go-to response when it comes to annoying people. Send her away. You know, that's what they said when the multitudes, you know, 5,000 Jewish men plus their wives and kids. Oh, what are we going to do? Just send them away, Lord, before they get too hungry. That's all they know at this point. So Jesus is working on them. And did you notice, though, why they said this? Notice what the disciples say here. For she cries after us. Uh, what? Who's us, Kimosabi? Uh, who's we? Jesus is probably thinking, they're not crying after you guys. She's crying after me. I'm the Lord. I'm the Master. I'm the Messiah, the Son of David. And so he has a lot of work to do on these guys because they're still looking at ministry from their own perspective and not from God's. Verse 24, but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's speaking to the disciples here. And she's listening very closely what, to what he's saying. Now, Jesus is just stating the fact that he is the promised Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. He says again, this is the second time he says, I was sent to the sheep of the house of Israel. I'm the promised Messiah for the Jews first and foremost. At the same time, Jesus knew most of Israel was going to reject him, and yet he was going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. He was shedding his blood for the whole human race, not just for the Jews. I mean, that's why we have John 3.16, for God so loved the world. What's the world? Is that just the chosen? Is that just the Jews? No, the world. That's everybody. He died for everybody. Not everybody's going to get saved because you have to come to faith in Christ alone for salvation. But he died. His blood was shed for all of us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. So every once in a while we see Jesus crossing over these barriers and these borders. And he goes out of Israel into Gentile territory. Again, he's teaching the, these disciples a very valuable lesson. So verse 25 then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Again, at first glance, it seems like Jesus is being a little harsh with her. The disciples are saying, send her away. Jesus is saying, well, I wasn't sent except to the sheep of Israel. She must be thinking, he doesn't really care about me. He, he doesn't really care about my daughter. Otherwise, he would be doing something. He's ignoring me. But instead of throwing her hands up and walking away, like I'm sure a lot of us do, Lord, I prayed about this for five minutes. You haven't answered me, so I'm done. No, she's persistent. She keeps crying out, Lord, help me. Talk about determination. She comes down and she bows before him and worships him. She knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is her only hope. And by the way, don't think that he's blowing her off. Again, he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's going to do in her situation. He's drawing a confession of faith out of her, as we'll see in a moment. And so he's really establishing and strengthening her faith. Again, don't be discouraged if the Lord doesn't answer you in a few minutes of prayer. He is God. He knows what he's doing. He knows what, how when to answer. Um, here's a great example of this woman. It's in Luke chapter 11, and we'll start in verse 5. And here Jesus is arguing from the lesser, which is this grouchy neighbor, <laughs> to the greater, our heavenly Father. So this is what Jesus says. He said to them, which of you having a friend, and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come uh, to me on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs." So then Jesus says, verse 9, So I say to you, ask, 
and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. And again, in the Greek tenses, it means literally keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Be persistent. God's timing is perfect. Don't give up after five minutes. Verse 10, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Yeah, I, some of you guys probably might do that. I don't know. I mean, that's just not what we would normally do. Jesus says, if you then, speaking to all of us dads, being evil, <laughs> know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And so again, it's that persistence. This woman is being persistent in her crying out to the Lord. She knows her only hope is in Jesus. So she cries out, Lord, help me. Now look at verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now that even sounds more harsh. Come on, Jesus, lighten up. Don't you call her a little dog. Be careful with this when you translate it. I mean, she instantly catches on to what Jesus is saying here. First of all, he's not calling her a dog in the sense of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they would call Gentiles dogs, which was a, he, uh, the word was goyim, which meant a scavenger, disease ridden dog, like a street dog, just a scavenger out there. You would keep it away from your family. Jesus uses a different word here. It's the word kunarian, and it means a house pet or a puppy. It was common in Israel to use a piece of bread. Well, you know how you've seen pot of stew, and they would have loaves of bread, and that's what they did you know, during communion and different things. They'd take off a chunk of bread, they'd pass it around, dip it in there, and double dip and triple dip. It's football season. You guys can all double dip your chips this weekend. That's fine. Well, probably not COVID. But, but they would do that then. They didn't worry about it. So when they would get to the end, they'd have a lot of these loaves of bread. It wasn't just one loaf, and they'd just kind of a little piece here and there. I mean, they were ripping off big chunks and eating it. At the end, when they finished up, if they had the end of a piece of the bread, the, guy, the husband, he would take it, he'd wipe off his face, do this with his hands, clean his hands with that last piece of bread, and then throw it on the floor for the dogs, the house pet. And they would feed him. That's what, they were, that's what he's referring to here. And she instantly catches on to what Jesus is saying. So here's Jesus. He's the bread of life. The religious leaders have basically wiped their hands of Jesus. We don't want anything to do with this guy. Tossing him away. And so this woman, she's begging Jesus for just a scrap of bread Basically thinking, well, the Pharisees don't want you. Religious leaders don't want you. I'll take whatever's left over. Whatever they don't want, Jesus, I know even a crumb is all I need. Again, this desperate lady is catching on to what he is saying. So she quickly responds, verse 27, and she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs, the house pets, eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And so she understands, and she's telling Jesus, I understand what you're saying. I acknowledge you're my master, and any crumbs that the Jews don't want, I'll gladly receive. I mean, she knows she's unworthy. She knows she's undeserving, just like all of us. But she's more than willing to just have even any leftovers from his ministry, from all that he's been doing. Just any crumb, Lord. I know I'm a Canaanite woman. I'm not of the sheep of Israel. I know I'm like a little dog under the table, but even the house pets get that little crumb that falls to the ground. Think of that little crumb of bread like it was a mustard seed. Remember, Jesus says, you have faith of the size of a mustard seed, the smallest seed in the garden? You can tell this mountain, be removed, cast into the sea. Well, that's how she's looking at it. Just, just that little crumb. That's all I need from you, Jesus. Just a crumb of your grace is more than sufficient to do what I need. Just a crumb of your love. Just, just I need you, Lord. And, and that's where her life is. That's where her hope is. To an outsider, 
it looks like Jesus is being kind of rejecting and a little harsh, but he, again, is bringing her to a place of faith and trust and hope. Again, maybe you're feeling desperate. Maybe you feel like you're at the end of your rope. You might have that prodigal son or prodigal daughter that you think is too far gone. No, no, there's always hope. God's not done with them yet. God's not done with any of us yet. Just give me some crumbs, Lord. I just need you, Jesus. Whatever you can send my way. Verse 28. Notice his response. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Why was this Gentile woman commended by Jesus for her faith that he refers to as great faith? Because again, she knew Jesus is my only hope. He's the only one that could deliver my daughter from that demon that is tormenting her, that's troubling her. In this same scene, look at these verses in Mark chapter 7, verse 29. It also records Jesus telling her, then he said to her, for this saying... Go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying or resting on the bed. Can you imagine just the joy that filled their hearts? The mother and daughter just embracing. She's no longer growling at me, (laughs) snarling. You know, she's not trying to strangle me. Now they're embracing. Think of the prodigal son. In Luke 15, you know, he goes off of his father's inheritance. He wastes it all on just worldly stuff. He finds himself in a pig pen. And then he says, if I just go back to my father, maybe he'll take me back as one of his slaves, his servants. Well, you know the story. The father sees his son coming a long way off. He runs out to his son. He throws his arms around his son. They just embrace. He kisses his son. My son who is lost has been found. He was dead. He's alive. And it was a time of rejoicing. That's the picture of this woman and her daughter. She's just, oh, man, what a glorious moment that was. Her daughter's in her right mind. She's, she's back, you might say. Just amazing. So when Jesus told this woman, for this saying, go your way, what saying is he referring to? Again, that simple belief and trust that Jesus has more than enough crumbs More than enough grace, mercy, love, compassion, and power to not only meet the needs of the Jewish people, but also to meet the needs of all of us Gentiles, to meet the needs of my daughter who's so desperate, who's so messed up. This is why Jesus tells her, great is your faith. In other words, Jesus just commends her. And she was able to see Jesus for who he truly is, the Lord, the Master, the Savior, the Messiah. And frankly, she had a lot more insight into who Jesus was than most of his disciples at this time. Even the 12, just get rid of her, send her away, she's annoying us. They're calling after her, she's calling after us. No, she's calling after Jesus. She knew he was her only hope. Now, from our perspective... We know from the scriptures that Jesus did come to the Jews first. Salvation is of the Jews. This is what John 4, 22 tells us. Jesus says, as he's speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. That's the only reason why the Jews are called the chosen people. God chose them when he separated Abram from the Ur of the Chaldeans. He takes them out, and he and Sarai, they become Abraham and Sarah. Through them would come Isaac, the son of promise. Through Isaac would be Jacob. And then through Jacob, the 12 tribes, through the tribe of Judah would come the promised Messiah. They were chosen to bring the Messiah into the world. And we know that the gospel of Christ needed to start in Jerusalem and then go throughout Judea into Samaria and the rest of the world. Again, Romans 1.16 Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, so Paul acknowledges that, 
and also for the Greek or the Gentiles. And so even though Jesus came to the house of Israel first, he never intended for the gospel to stay in Israel. The gospel had to go out from Israel to all of us lost, desperate sinners. And he knew that he was the Savior of all people who would believe on him and him alone for salvation. We already saw John 3.16, For God so loved the world. The Apostle John says in 1 John 2, verse 2, And he himself, speaking of Jesus, is a propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means the satisfaction of God's wrath. So Jesus satisfied the wrath that we deserve. So he's the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And we see the reality of his far-reaching gospel, and we'll get to experience it face-to-face -face with the Lord and all of our brothers and sisters in glory when we read this in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, where it says, They sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain and have redeemed us. Who can sing this? Only the bride of Christ have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And so what a great insight this desperate Canaanite woman had concerning the grace and the compassion and the power of Jesus to deliver, to save, to heal. So after this amazing encounter, Jesus goes back towards the Sea of Galilee. Look at verse 29. Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. So when he leaves, it says he skirted the Sea of Galilee. So from your point, here's the Mediterranean Sea. He's down here. Sea of Galilee's right here. And he skirts it. He goes north around it, and he comes back over here to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And he sits on a mountain there. It says in Mark chapter 7, verse 31, this is where we're given a little more information as to where Jesus went. It says, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. In other words, that is still Gentile territory. Decapolis, it was ten cities there. This is where he went when he cast the demon out of Legion. Remember, he had all those demons in him. And what's your name? Legion, for we are many. And then there was 2,000 pigs in a herd there. And so Jesus made the first devil to him. Um, he did. Come on. He cast the demons into 2,000 pigs. They all run over the embankment in the Sea of Galilee and drown. So deviled him. There you go. <laughs> so that's where he is. He's back in Gentile territory. And Jesus is in this region again because he's trying to develop a heart of compassion in his disciples. And he's wanting to develop this heart of compassion in us, too, because we like to look at people, oh, that person, they look like they deserve heaven. No. <laughs> that person, they, they don't really need Jesus. You know, they're to this or that. And, you know, we can put people in category. God loves everybody. He died for everybody. It doesn't matter how down and out or discouraged they are. It doesn't matter how wealthy or poor. Jesus died for the sins of the world. So look at verse 30. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel." So here's all these Gentiles glorifying the God of Israel. Now, a couple of things to take note of here. He's, he's going to be there for three days, and as fast as they can bring people and lay them at his feet, he heals them. And this goes on for three solid days, just bringing people to him. How did that avalanche of people start coming to him? There's one event that Mark records that started that avalanche flowing and, and starting this this crazy cascade of people coming to him. It's in Mark chapter 7, 
where Jesus touches this one guy in a very unique way. Look at this, verse 32. Then they brought to him one who was deaf. This is when he first comes back into this region of Decapolis. And they bring to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his, light, uh, his hand on him. Just touch him, Lord. We know you can heal him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears. I love this. He spat and touched his tongue. Oh! I mean, he's, this is what Jesus does. Literally, he puts his fingers in the guy's ears, sticks it on his tongue. <laughs> CNN would go ballistic over this today. <laughs> he can't do that. He's going to spread COVID or something. It's just nuts. <laughs> he spits on his you know, fingers, and he touches the guy's tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ifatha, or be opened. Immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. Now notice, then he commanded them that they should tell no one. <laughs> We've seen that before. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And so that obviously didn't work because now this is right after that is when you see this multitude of people. They just keep coming and coming with more sick and more disabled people. And he touches them. He heals them. You can't keep Jesus to yourself when he's radically changed your life, when he's saved you from your sins. He doesn't want us to keep the gospel to ourselves. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm saved. I don't care about the rest of you idiots. You deserve hell. No. He wants us to have that same love and compassion for everybody out there. Sometimes, here's a, something amazing about Jesus. One thing for certain about Jesus is that you could never be certain how he was going to heal somebody. Sometimes he would just speak the word and they were healed. Sometimes he would just you know, touch them and they'd be healed. Sometimes people would touch the hem of his garment and they were healed. One of my favorites, though, is kind of like this one where Jesus is at the Pool of Siloam. There's a guy that's blind there, and the guy's just wanting to be healed, and all of a sudden you hear Jesus go, <laughs> and the guy, I'm, I'd be like, uh, what's going on here? And Jesus says he makes a little mud ball out of his spit, and he sticks it in the guy's eyes. And then he says, now go wash in the pool. Well, yeah, you just spit in my eye. Yeah, I need to wash this out. But the guy was healed. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to what Jesus did. He is the Lord. He does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. But here, look again at the end of verse 31. All that Jesus did caused these Gentiles to glorify the God of Israel. What a contrast to the Jewish leaders. They wanted to kill him. But these Gentiles recognize who he is. Verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Now, I'm, the obvious thing is, do you guys have compassion on the multitude? But Jesus says, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. So again, he has compassion for these lost, desperate people. And it's because they've been with him for three days. They have nothing to eat. It's obviously that they've had this spiritual hunger, and he's been meeting that. Now they have this physical hunger. And it's almost like he's baiting his disciples here. And I don't want to send them away, you know, unless they just faint on the way. He just kind of leaves it out there for them. And the disciples... I'm sure they're thinking, well, there's nothing we can do for them. And it's crazy. Watch what happens with these guys. You know, you would think by now they would say, well, you know what? Just last chapter, <laughs> chapter 14, he fed them with a little Lunchable. Uh, what is he going to do here? I don't know. Maybe we just need to get rid of these people again. No, look at verse 33. Then his disciples said to him, where can we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such great multitude? It's like you would think it would hit them. It's like, just in chapter 14, <laughs> he healed 5,000 know, men plus their wives or kids, Fifteen to 20,000 people. What an amazing miracle. Did they forget that already? No. So what's going on in their minds? It's their prejudice. They're thinking, he won't do this for Gentiles. He only did that for the Jews. 
he doesn't love these guys like he loves our people. And so that's still in their minds. He's like, oh, you won't never do this for these Gentiles. Again, he was wanting them to know that he's the Messiah. He's the Savior for everybody, not just the Jewish people. So look at verse 34. Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit, uh, sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So this is like deja vu all over again. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were 4,000 men, besides women and children, it's funny because there's some commentators who try to say, oh, see, there's a mistake in the Bible here. This is the same miracle. They just got their facts wrong. It's like, are you kidding me? He's in Gentile territory this time. The other one was with the Jews, but we'll see why that makes no sense here in a moment. Now those who ate 4,000 men besides women and children, verse 39, and he sent away the multitude, got into the boat, and came to the region of Magdala. And we'll look at that, Lord willing, next time. So again, very similar to when he fed the 5,000 men. Here it's 4,000 men, plus their wives and kids. So what, Twelve to 15,000 people that he feeds with this little lunch. In the same way, Jesus involves his disciples in the ministry. Jesus did the miracle. I mean, he's creating the fish and the loaves. They just keep multiplying. Yet, he uses the disciples to distribute the food to the masses of people. In the same way, God has given us his word. He created it, Genesis to Revelation, period, the word of God. He's entrusted it to us. He's a creator. We're the distributor. He wants us to get the word of God out, the gospel to a lost and dying world around us. And so in that respect, Jesus wants all of us to be more than spectators, but also to be participators with him. Jesus could have used an angel just to fly around the heavens and tell everybody about the gospel of Christ. And he will. It's in Revelation 4, 14, verse 6. That's where he sends an angel with an everlasting gospel to preach every tribe, tongue, nation, and people in the world during the Great Tribulation. But for now, he wants to use us. Another similarity is that all the people ate and were filled, and it's the same Greek word means they were stuffed. They, they were gorged. They were full to the max with bread and fish. One of the differences here that we know this is not the same as in chapter 14 is the word basket. There's two different Greek words for basket. The one used for the Jews referred to a basket that was big, but it had a narrow top and they had a lid on it. And so that's when they took those to the Jewish people and they came back with 12 basketfuls. This is a different word for basket and it means like a hamper. It's like a big wide opening. Exact same word is used of basket. Remember when they lowered the apostle Paul from a wall in Damascus in a basket? That's the same basket. So it's a big hamper, big enough for you to sit in. So they take these baskets, large baskets, out to the people. But this time the disciples gather up seven baskets full of leftovers. I don't know why it's seven. I mean, the number seven in the scriptures often refers to completeness, perfection. Um, there's seven colors in a rainbow. There's seven notes in a musical scale. There's seven days of the week. In the book of Revelation, the number seven is used 54 times. You know, the, the seven churches of Revelation, the seven uh, seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven bull I mean, there's seven, 54 times. So it means complete. God is in complete control during that time as well. Anyway, be that as it may, what I love about these two scenes with the Jews being fed and here the Gentiles being fed, in a lot of ways, this is a foreshadowing of what we're going to experience in the near future when the groom comes for his bride and then we get to experience the marriage supper of the Lamb the marriage feast of the Lamb. You can read about it in Revelation 19, the first half there. It's going to be awesome. Think of this as I close. God loves you. Jesus loves you. He, this blows me away. Jesus, because we're always saying, I can't wait to go home and be with Jesus. I'm so excited. We're getting out of here soon. 
Praise the Lord. You know what Jesus is thinking? This is what he's thinking because it tells us. I can't wait for them to be up here, Lord, or Father. I can't wait for them to be here with us, to see us in glory. That's his attitude right now. How do I know that? Remember the prayer in John 17, the real Lord's prayer when Jesus is praying on behalf of the 12, and then he's praying for the whole church, the believers that are going to come. This is what he says to all of those who are going to come. John 17, verse 24. This blows me away. Jesus says, Father, I desire that they, speaking of all believers, that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Where is he? In glory. That they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus longs for that day. Even more so than we long to be with him, he longs for us to be with him in glory. Amazing. So think about that. Think about these things when you're with unbelievers. Think about that fact that he loves them just as much as he loves you. He died for them just as much as he died for you. He shed his blood. It's the only acceptable, sufficient payment to cleanse all people of every sin that they've ever committed. What a good Father, what a gracious Lord and Savior we have. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your amazing plan of salvation that you would send your only begotten Son into this sinful world where there is none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, for paying that price in full. Your perfect spotless blood. Thank you, Lord, for just the crumbs that have fallen from the table that we have scarfed down and we've experienced your grace, your goodness, your love, your compassion. Lord, I know for myself and I'm sure for a lot of us here that we've only experienced the tip of the proverbial iceberg when it comes to knowing how good you are, how loving, how gracious you are. But we thank you, Lord, for what you have revealed to us in your word that you do love us, that you're waiting to come through that open door in heaven and you're going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and then the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet you, Lord, in the air, and thus we shall always be with you. Father, stir our hearts up in these last days in which we live. And we know a lot of people for many years have been saying we're in the last days, and yes, we are. But I think we're in the last minute of the last hour of the last days. And so, Lord, prepare our hearts. We want to stand before you in joy, just worshiping you and giving you all the praise and glory. And, Lord, may that even start now in many of our lives that we would just put our, our, our focus on you and set our minds on things above where you're seated and that we would just marvel at your goodness and grace. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.